four P's that you and the world needs. We've talked about this. And I want you to personalize this. As a Christian, you have the person of Jesus Christ on the inside of you. <clears throat> it makes all the difference in the world. When you need a solution, you can go ask them. You, when you're going through the world and you see people down and depressed and discouraged, they, don't, they cannot turn to Jesus on that same level. They can turn to Him for salvation, and you go to Him and say, listen, you don't have to go through this alone. I know Jesus is bewildered, belittled. Jesus is not lifted up. He's considered just a man. But you go, you know, my life has changed since I met the man Jesus. He is a relationship. He, he, he lived. He rose again. Uh, he died. He rose again three days later. And He is at the right hand of God the Father. And many times He walks the earth. A lot of times He walks the earth appealing. And He will speak to you too. You can know His voice. That's the prophetic part. It is maybe not a popular message, but it's a message. I'm telling you, everybody deep down wants to hear if and when it's spoken clearly. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, um, Eternity is written in the hearts of everyone. Everyone you see is a supernatural being. They may not be in contact with the supernatural at this moment, but they are supernatural. Well, Craig, how can you say that? Because when they die... Their soul and their spirit goes to heaven or hell and they live forever. They may not have the same body. They'll get a different body in hell. That will get a different body in heaven. But it, every person is supernatural. And if you look around people, the supernatural's made fun of. It's, it's not identified. But down deep inside, when we speak prophetically over them and say, Jesus loves you. Jesus wants a relationship with you. Just as simple as that. It'll start giving hooks that the Holy Spirit can give. You may even get prophetic words over them. And if you need them, wake up in the morning and say, Father, I've got a problem. I need a solution. Thank you for a solution. You're going to speak to me directly. It says that we can hear in wisdom or revelation. Wisdom is where we go out and search it in the Scriptures. Then we apply it to our life. Revelation is where just an idea drops in. And um, uh, we weren't even ready for it, but it just comes through. And it's just a big deal. These are simple truths. And in many ways, we need to get back to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I went through recently the entire book of Acts, all 28 chapters. And whenever it said somebody got saved or there was believers, I wrote down the pattern of what happened before, during, and after to get them saved, trying to find models for evangelism. The first 12 chapters is about the apostles. It was the same model all the way through. The four S's. That was me. Put my words on it. The first one, always between Acts 1 to Acts 12, something supernatural happened. Supernatural. Many people in the world today in this region don't want Christianity because they've experienced Christianity without the supernatural. One thing that will draw them is the supernatural. Prophetic words, miracles, healings, deliverance. You see all of that through the first 12 chapters. Something supernatural happened. And then somebody spoke. That's the second spoke. Spoke. Second S. They spoke and explained this is what just happened, why it happened, and it was always the simplicity of Jesus has touched you. You need Him in your life. He is the Savior. They spoke him as a savior. It was not, you go back to, it was not a complex teaching. Every time it was the same thing. Jesus, the person, just did this prophetically or supernaturally in your life, and you need him. And this is how you get saved. And then the third and fourth S did not always happen. The first two always happened, supernatural and spoke. The third one was the Holy Spirit would come along, and Acts 2, they used the word pierced. I, I put an S in because it's 
It's sensitive. They were sensitive to the Holy Spirit after seeing the supernatural, hearing the Word spoke. Sometimes the Word was conviction. Sometimes the Word was piercing. But it was the sensitivity the Holy Spirit came in because they had a hook of the supernatural and a hook of you speaking. You can make a difference in your world by praying, looking for opportunities for the supernatural, prophetic words, praying for healing, and then immediately go, it's all about a person. In Acts 13, it's switched. Same four things, but the order switched. In Acts 13, it, it's talking about releasing Paul from the city of Antioch to go out. So 13 through 28 is all about Paul. The first 12 chapters is all about the uh, other 12 apostles. Acts 13 is all about Paul and the uh, missionary journey. And there was a definite switch in Acts 13. Now, he was always first sent to the Jews, and then when the Jews rejected him in every town, he went to the Gentiles. I think this is why the switch was. But what happened is one and two switched. He would go and speak, then this, he would then he would do some supernatural act, or the Holy Spirit would, and then the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit would come into salvation. So it switched there. They spoke first, and then the supernatural followed. This is the key. Look for the supernatural in your life wherever you go. And just step out. It's not about you. It's about uh, the Lord's Prayer. We got written on the wall on the left side. Thy kingdom come. You can Well, there's many things. But one way to summarize the, the Lord's Prayer is Thy, your kingdom come, your will be done. And so be sensitive I mean, you don't do this to everybody, but be sensitive. Realize the hope of this world is first Jesus Christ. And many times He'll do the supernatural, the prophetic, in you and to other people to get their attention. Oh my gosh, what just happened? It's like starting a a dead battery. There are dead batteries all around you. Dead spiritual, supernatural parts in their life. When you do the supernatural, it's like hooking up jumper cables. And it's jumping them out of the natural, helping start their engine to see into the spirit realm when they get a prophetic word or encouragement or even a healing or praying over them. All of a sudden, what you're doing is putting jumper cables on them and they're starting to see into the spirit that maybe there's a spirit realm. And then you say, there is a spirit realm. And the connection to the spirit realm is accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and walking in a relationship with Him. No place was there the supernatural without the speaking of what just happened. Amen? Amen. And then as they, and then this, the last two points that we're going to summarize going through here is the principles, we've talked about this a lot, so I'm not going to belabor it, I, but I cannot overemphasize how important the Word of God is. And it's so under attack. As we talked about last week, we went through Psalms 2. Psalms 2 is a prophetic picture of where the nations are at. And I'm going to paraphrase because I don't want to take the time to look it up. But Psalms 2, it starts out, it goes, the kings of the earth, which we don't have kings, but the nations of the earth are raging against God to get the fetters and the chains removed. What are the fetters and the chains? It's the Word of God to say, don't be sexually perverse, don't be corrupt, walk in righteousness, and all the other principles of the Bible. They want to be totally free. And in many ways, that is happening Psalms 2 is happening in the nations. We've thrown off the fetters and the chains. Now, let me throw this out. Every person on the earth will be bound by something. There is no true freedom. We're not that good. We're either going to be bound by the Word of God and applying it to your life, or we'll be bound by the chains of fear, the devil, and whatever else he brings. There is no freedom without form. If you think there's total freedom, you end up in anarchy and lawlessness. 
every f- true freedom has some form that is a boundary around you. And I'm telling you, be bound by the Word of God, the principles, that bound produces promises. That bound, as we've talked so much about principles, produces stability. It produces direction. It produces purpose. We're living now in a lawless society, literally, defunding the police. Lawless, don't tell me what to do. The problem is we will individually, you'll end up in some kind of chaos and anarchy because without a form, it becomes chaos. And so we're switching one blessings for another bondage. In some sense, there's the bondage of the Word of God, but it produces promises. Right now they say there's no absolutes. Fine. What did you just say? Anybody get that? Right. It's, it's illogical. We have, we are living in the age where we call evil good and good evil. We are in a lawless state that they talk about in the end times, except in this room. Now, I know we're not technically under the law, but the law of the principles produce freedom as we submit to the Word of God. And it will produce promises. We're going to go through this. This is good. And you can share this with your neighbors. You can put it into your life. When people come to me for counseling or talk, they're coming because there's some kind of chaos in their life. Something that's not going well. Something that's broken down. You know, this is all I do in counseling. Now, there's a trick. Not a trick. It's, it may take some time. You're dealing with people in your classes. You're deal, Jan's dealing with people in her classes. What you're, you're dealing with, what you're doing basically at a basic level is you're going, where does, where have there been decisions made that are against the principles of the Bible? Now, that may take some time, it may take some questions, and then they may or may not do it. But when you align yourself with the principles of parenting in the Bible, principles of of marriage in the Bible, principles of finance, that means we have to know the Bible. But as we know those things and we align up with Him, these are not just spiritual principles. He has put them into the earth and have become natural principles. Marriage is a perfect example. Adam and Eve. When we do marriage that way, it is a natural principle. And if we do some other principle, we redefine marriage, it does not reproduce. Are you hearing me? You can do whatever you want, but it doesn't reproduce. So it will die at the end of your relationship. But as we line up with the Word of God... It always reproduces good fruit. Now, it's made fun of because we said last week the nations are raging. They're wanting to throw off the fetters. I think it was Psalms 2, 4 or 5, verse 4 or 5. God just says, He just laughs and mocks at them. He's laughing at our country now. That's what it says. He's mocking them and going, Do you think, I'm adding some words here, with your billions and trillions of dollars in nuclear weapons and you're screaming, you think you're actually going to get away with this? He says, I have destined for my son to, through the people to have the nations as my inheritance. And he will rule. I don't know what's going to happen between here and there we're, because we're in this foolish state. Lawless, lawlessness always leads to foolishness. When you say, I don't want a law around me, you become lawless. The Bible is very clear. When you become lawless, you lose discernment. Why? Because you don't have anything to tell you right or wrong. Today I wake up and I want to do this. It may be good, may not. Well, t- today's Wednesday. I, wanna, I don't want to do that anymore. And you, you, you lose direction. You lose discernment. There's no guidance. But when you get up in the morning and you say, Father, I recommit my life to you. Tell me your principles by wisdom or revelation. Give me guidance and direction. Let me read, read your scriptures. And you get in there and you go, oh, this is the direction I go. 
I guarantee you it always produces good fruit. Now, you may have to hoe the weeds out. You may have to trim the trees up some. Did you have to trim the trees in the orange grove? How many trees did you have? 60 acres of trees. That's a lot of trimming. My gosh. I've just got 60 Bradford pears, and that's enough for me. you got to work to get there, but it's always going to produce fruit. And the cool thing is, you can tell people, They go, why is your life so blessed? That's because I've got promises activating in my life. And they won't activate for you. Wow. You're being racist. White supremacist. You're being discriminatory. It's just true. As a Christian, you have the person of Jesus Christ. You can hear His voice. You get principles. And he, you are guaranteed promises that don't come until you're in Him and applying His principles. Now, it goes in that order for the most part. And it's cool. And you know what? Let me find the right verse. I am just talking today. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man. He can't lie. Nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I went on a search of trying to figure out how many biblical promises are in the Bible. It was sort of fruitless. Well, I mean, I got some fruit out of it. The word promise appears 100 times in all the Scripture, actual word. But there's a book called What the Bible Says About Praise and Promise. It says there's 1,000 promises. Then there was another book, an old 200-year-old book called, by Samuel Clark called Precious Bible Promises. It said there's 30,000 promises. I did not take the time to read the book. Then there's another book called All the Promises of the Bible by a guy named Everett R. Storms. I obviously just copied this out. He said that number's too high. It, it all def- depends on how you define promises. But a promise is something, if you do this, I'll do this. Most of the time. But sometimes he'll say, still do that. But that's the thing. He says there's 8,810 promises. So somewhere between 100 and 30,000, there's a bunch of promises. Let me just go through some of these because it's good. This is what you get as a Christian that you do not get as a non-Christian. And I just want to build your faith up. It's just built in. You know, when I got a new TV, 4K was built in, UHD was built in, the nice big screen was built in. I got a three-year warranty, that was, or whatever the warranty was, that's built in. I got a remote control, that was built, that all came out of the box. When you become a Christian, there's just some things come out of the box. Some of them are conditional on the promises. But the first one is this, salvation. Do you realize Christianity is the only religion, even today, that you have an assurance of salvation? If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess his sins, you're assured, even xylophone, when she does that. Does that offend you when I call her xylophone? I like that. It's like a musical instrument. Squeaky. She needs to be tuned up. So can you can you tune a xylophone? Okay, here's another one. Romans 8, 28. How many of y'all know that? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His promise. If you're doing the best you know how, doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you even did it right. But in the end, if you're following Him, repent. If you didn't follow Him, it works together for good. How many of your neighbors, how many of us in this room just need to be reminded, 
it's going to work out. It's all right. Just keep your eyes on him. He will get you there. That's a cool promise. If you weren't a Christian, you have no guarantee it's going to work together for good. Just remember that. And somebody, you don't say it this way, but somebody's struggling at work, you just say, hey, you know, it can work together for good if you give your life to Jesus Christ. And you follow Him, it'll work out. And then there's a journey, you got to walk through it, but you're no longer doing it by yourself. These are simple things that we often forget that are built in when you became a Christian. I don't think there's anybody unbeliever in here. If you are, you've done good hiding it. Here's another one. Be with us in trials. 2 Corinthians 1.3 Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles. Next time you're anxious, just go before the Lord and you'll start feeling peace come in. Unbelievers don't have that. This is a great program, man. It is great. It is better than anything around. We need to start a multi-level marketing organization for Christians. Abundant life. John 10.10. 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. So when you're stolen from, you about die. You're destroyed. I've had all of that in my life. Stolen, about died, destroyed. This is what I say. Father, I thank you that you're going to bring abundant life and you're going to overcome this thing. That's a promise. And it's not based on me doing it perfectly. It's based on me keeping my eyes on Jesus, keeping my heart clean. And I say, Father, I thank you for an abundant life. Oh, here's a good one. You become mature. Aren't you tired of whiny babies? Oh, did I say that again? Where's the governor? Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Now, I know we want to turn to somebody close to us and go, God, please complete this person. And they may need it, but don't pray that. It never works. Just pray it over yourself. Father, today, I thank you I'm becoming more complete. Complete means maturity here. That doesn't mean you have a bigger bank account. Well, that may happen. Peace. My gosh, do we, how many people are uptight today, anxious, shred, fear? The COVID thing's just the fear of this thing's off the scale And I know we need wisdom as to what to do. But he said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding regard to your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you start feeling anxious, it's built into the package that you got of Christianity and it's cool. Say, Father, I thank you for your peace. I think you don't even have to go, is this your will? Anxiousness is not his will, peace is. And just say, Father, I thank you for peace. Now, you may have to do that a few times during the day. But just start going, Father, I thank you for peace. These are promises that are yours. And they can be your neighbors that aren't saved if they'll walk through point number one first. See what the devil has stolen from our culture? Can you imagine a whole nation, abundant life? A whole nation walking in peace? A whole nation... Uh, being comforted and working together for good, that would be cool, wouldn't it? It can happen. I think we'll get back there. He's, he's trying to call the nations to him, and I'm believing for America to be a sheep nation. Bah. We don't want no goat nations. They're not as cute. Sheeps are cute, aren't they, until they butt you. We had a sheep when I was growing up. What was his name? Clyde. Clyde. This dude was an ornery sheep. He was in the kingdom, but he hadn't been redeemed yet. He would butt you, wouldn't he? So, but we're getting a whole thing of cute, cuddly sheep. No clod sheep. Rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Physical needs met. What shall we, uh, Matthew 6, 31, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. It's like a rat. I mean, it's like a hamster on a hamster wheel every day, isn't it? Going after all these things. You know, he is trying to bring us to a place of rest. We've talked about this before. Bob Jones said the 2020s, 25 years ago, would be a, a, a decade of rest. And I'm still, 
I'm glad I still got nine more years because I'm still not even close. But he's wanting to bring us to a place where he gives us stuff out of overflow instead of us stress, strains, trying to figure it out, keep drawing on him like, you know, our well's dry. Did you all get that? He's trying to get us to a place of rest and not wrestling for the things of God. It's a big challenge. If you're wrestling, take a little another squirrel trip. If you're wrestling and stressed out over things, you're probably not handling it right. And go, Father, let me enter into your rest and peace. I'll do what you want me to do. Otherwise, I thank you that out of, as I fill up my reservoir of being in your presence, the overflow, you'll take care of it. And if you want me to do something, I'll do it. Our default, let me throw this out. I hope this comes across well because I'm not going to develop it. Our default should be rest. Oh, man. All right, we've got 8,803 more promises to go over. Let me end with this one because I've spoken long enough. And uh, we'll go into worship. 3 John 2, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and all that may go well and, and that all may go well with you, even if as your soul is getting along well. Alright, so there's a principle here. There's a principle of supernatural healing. He comes in, you get a, a battery jump start, he just takes care of your body. And that's awesome. That's one way to get health. There's another way. That as you work on your soul, getting it rightly aligned with God, as it says here, even as your soul is going well, the overflow of your soul following His principles will start affecting your body. As we learn in our soul to rest, so we won't both ways, but as we learn, let's take a principle, learn to rest in our souls it will start bringing rest to our bodies. How many of us are stressed out over things? It affects your body. As we walk in forgiveness towards others, the Bible's real clear. You can go out here and Google it. It says if you don't walk in forgiveness coming out of your soul, it sets up a root of bitterness that will affect your body and cause it to grow older. So we want the supernatural healings But we also want long term for our souls to be aligned with God and it affects your body. We want both of those. Y'all are looking at me like deer in the headlights. Is anybody awake? Nobody rose their hand. So nobody, oh, Jeremy did. You're hearing from God over there, brother. I I, I attest to that. Amen. Let's stand and just, I don't know what we do. I turn it over to the worship team. Y'all do whatever.